Um, I'm going to be talking today about digital emblems, and that is kind of a neologism, so it'll take a little bit of explaining what they are and why this is interesting from a technical point of view. This is basically reporting out of work that is happening in the Internet Engineering Task Force that's building on top of uh, existing protocols, DNS, DNSSEC, and Dane. Um, so, let's get started. Um, the idea behind digital emblems is that they will supplement or eventually maybe replace the physical markings that are required on things in under international law. So let's take a look at some examples of what those physical markings are. Um, going sort of, you know, clockwise from the top right, see a press a photographer with the, the press marking. Uh, the thing with the orange background is uh, ISO container marking, which every ISO container out there has one of those on it, with serial number and a lot of standardized information. We've got some UN blue helmets. Uh, they're a marking that's recognized under uh, international law, Geneva Conventions specifically, um, for peacekeepers. The thing under that is uh, four different chemical weapons components. Uh, chemicals that are being shipped in a cardboard box. Um, under that, there is the end of a wooden pallet. Every piece of wood that crosses an international border has to be marked to show how it's been uh, freed of termites and stuff. Uh, next to that, there's the blue and white shield of UNESCO for a World Heritage uh, Site or World uh, Heritage Artwork. Uh, next to that, every piece of radioactive material, every piece of radioactive fuel or waste that crosses an international border has to be marked. And then the orange bag there is a diplomatic pouch. Uh, the Vienna Convention of 1961 on Diplomatic Relations says all about how diplomatic pouches have to be handled. They can't be uh, delayed or inspected. So let's take a look at one of those in a little more detail. This is the phytosanitary marking the the one that goes on to wood crates and uh and pallets so this is administered by the food and agriculture organization that is an intergovernmental organization that is responsible for the international plant protection convention that is the body of law that requires this marking uh and then specifically uh, there's a, a, a particular law, the International Standard for Phytosanitary Measures, number 15, requires this marking. So within that marking, you've got a country code, region code, uh, the treatment service provider license number, the person who did the, uh, the treatment of the, the crate or whatever, uh, how the treatment was done. And then you've got some sort of serialization. So a thing to notice about this is this is a hot metal brand shoved into a piece of wood with variable data on it, right? Hot metal brand, <laughs> variable data. We're engineers. We know how to deal with variable data. The hot metal brand part seems like it doesn't scale so well, though. Uh, so what are problems with physical markings? It's really hard to tell whether a physical marking is being misused. Did the person who put the physical marking on something, were they authorized to do that? Does it still apply? Uh, was it marked and got scraped off, right? There are lots and lots of issues with physical markings. Um, but beyond that, typically they're not, they're, they're meant to be human readable, but they're not optimized for machine readability. And then you can't actually apply them to something that's not physical. So digital data, you can't apply a physical mark to digital data and expect it to be readable. You can apply it to the thing that holds the data, but not to the data itself. And if, for instance, an attacker is coming in over the network, they can't see the physical thing that they're attacking. So they can't see whether something, some mark's been stenciled on it. Um, and, and electronic services, right? Not just data at rest or data in flight, but like an email server. How would you mark that an email server was protected or licensed or whatever, right? Um, so beyond that, when we start to get into cryptographic authentication, 
we get this whole suite of additional capabilities around revocation and you know things timing out and signature roles and all, all these kinds of things that we we kind of take for granted uh in cryptography which you know people who do physical markings you know they got a stencil and a rattle can and you know they don't have any of those tools so how do we move forward what what can we what can we mark with a digital album right now it's defined as people places things data at rest data in flight and online services uh and you know throughout the rest of this talk and in the standards documents and so forth we just refer to all of that collectively as assets uh because we're not trying to differentiate them in any way right we want a standard that works with all of them um there are a couple of non-goals, things that come up in conversation a lot with people who are first looking at this problem space. So people look at the protective emblems, particularly like that UNESCO emblem that gets put on, for instance, a church in Ukraine, right? Um, and then the Russians come along and blow up the church. And people say, well, that emblem didn't protect the church. Just like if we put a digital emblem on a website, and somebody DDoSes the website, okay, it didn't protect the website, but neither would a physical marking, right? The, the, the physical marking or the digital marking, what it's doing is it's making the job of a lawyer in The Hague easier, right? If they want to prosecute somebody for a war crime, showing that the person was duly informed that what they were doing was or about to do was a war crime before they did it and did it knowingly and maliciously, right? That makes their job as a lawyer easier. Um, and then, you know, all the, the sort of just compliance markings, this is about ease of use, right? It's about making the job of a customs inspector easier. Um, it's not going to do any magic. You know, it's not going to do anything really differently than the physical marking. Uh, it's just easier. And then the other thing is a lot of people think, well, if you if you do this digital emblem and you embody it in a QR code, somebody could just copy that QR code from one crate to another crate and, oh, we've hacked the system, right? But that's not how it works. This is like saying, if I copy the URL of a website onto another thing that I've hacked the website. No, the website is still out there in the internet. The digital emblem is still out there in the internet. What's marked on the crate or the building or somebody's ID card is essentially just like a URL, right? It's a label that the validator is going to go and check. Um, so the trick is not physically attaching it to the thing, the trick is associating it with the thing. So when somebody looks at it, they'll understand that yes, this is the right thing. Um, so let's let's take a look at that a little bit more closely. We've got an issuer, somebody who is creating digital emblems, um, and they create a bundle of of records that are the digital emblem, and then they sign it. That gets attached to an asset through a description. The description says, you know, this digital emblem applies to this person. This digital emblem applies to this crate. This digital emblem applies to this building or this vehicle. Um, and that description is going to be a serial number or a height or mass or location or time and place. So a validator, somebody who wants to figure out whether this thing is legit, is going to evaluate first the signature to make sure that the issuer is a legitimate issuer, right, is, is who they're expecting. And they're going to check the description to make sure that the asset is the thing described by the emblem. So who are validators? Um, a lot of people really focus on the military uses. So you can have a loitering munition that's sitting around up there and it's nighttime and you've got a convoy and, you know, one truck has the medical supplies. And so that one is the one that's protected under the Geneva Conventions. The other ones have ammunition. They are not protected. The loitering munition has to make a decision between these. 
if it can make a decision based on something machine readable and cryptographically authenticatable, it's going to make a much better decision than if it's up there in the dark trying to figure out whether there's a marking on the side of a truck that it's looking at the top of, right? Um, but by and large, this is going to get used by customs agents, right? 99 times out of 100, it's going to be somebody scanning a cargo container or, you know, a crate or whatever. So what problem is this mostly solving? Proliferation of proprietary scanners. So what's happening right now is these markings already exist and a lot more besides that. And people are trying to digitize them. People are trying to take these physical markings and, and create some digital workflow around them. And so, you know, they come up with something and maybe it's kind of a hack and it involves a scanner that some that a validator can use to point at the box or whatever and you know press the button and look at the screen on the back and it says yes this is okay or no this is counterfeit goods or no this has been tampered with or whatever um so the problem is that customs agents are starting to get more and more of these proprietary scanners stacking up so a shipment comes in they have to go to the closet, rummage around, figure out what the right scanner is, whether the battery is charged, and then go scan the thing. And this is just the tip of the iceberg, right? This is just the first few organizations that have started to do this. And, you know, these organizations are not happy about having to develop this themselves. So you've got folks like Apple, folks like Cisco, folks like Nokia, who are really concerned about counterfeit goods, and they've got international law on their side. WIPO administers, I think, 38 different international laws, several of which are about uh, counterfeiting. So, you know, they can work with customs agents to identify legitimate versus counterfeit goods, but their systems, like each of those, each of those companies I just mentioned, each one has a completely different system for doing it, different physical scanner, different software, different everything. So this is the main thing we're trying to solve, right? We're trying to get an open standard that can be implemented in open source software or on open hardware cheaply. Everybody can just make do with a single scanner that will scan all of these different kinds of things. So what's a digital emblem look like? We've got in the, the top left there, the issuer, uh, bottom left, the asset, the validator over on the right, the digital emblem is the set of records there that are in that green box. And that's the binding, first issuer to emblem, and then emblem to asset. So, and this is just some examples, right? There are actually a whole lot more different, very specific bindings that are available. So we've got a visual representation of the emblem, right? If it's a diplomatic pouch from Cote d'Ivoire, the Cote d'Ivoire national seal, is going to be the visual representation. We've got an identification of law. Again, if it's a diplomatic pouch, it's going to be the Vienna Convention of Diplomatic Relations, 1961. We've got the contact information. In this case, it would be the contact information of the logistics person in the foreign ministry of Cote d'Ivoire, who's responsible for administering their diplomatic shipments. We've got handling flags. Is there anything fragile here? Does it need to be in the pressurized compartment of the airplane hold? Uh, what should we do if, you know, the handling conditions are, are violated? We've got the issuer's cryptographic signature, and then we've got third-party signatures. These are cross-signatures to create a web of trust. Let's say you're a customs agent and, you know, you get something that comes in from the Cote d'Ivoire uh, Foreign Ministry and you know, you have no idea whether they're legit or not. You haven't heard of Cote d'Ivoire before, but there are five different other signatures on there, one from Guinea and one from Gambia and one from Niger, right? All saying, yes, you know, this is this is a real foreign ministry that we <laughs> work with and recognize as being a legit country, right? So those cross signatures, that web of trust, just like in PGP, it gives you some assurance that you're dealing with a real entity and not like a typo squatter or somebody using a homograph in the label name. So then on the asset, we've got a temporal and a spatial scope of validity. 
is this thing in the place it's supposed to be at the time it's supposed to be? And so that's probably going to be a series of things, right? And um, if it's on an airplane, that's going to be a series of long, skinny polygons covering the airplane flight, the projected airplane flight, and then the airport at the destination where it's going to be going through customs, for instance. Um, so that pairing of a bunch of locations and times gives some idea of, of when and where this thing should be accepted. So to give a different example, let's say that we have a diplomatic envoy whose mission is in Germany in 2025, and yet they show up in Hungary in December of 2024 and they present their credential. The, you know, the, the, the immigration Im guy in Hungary can evaluate this and say, okay, that's nice, but you're just a regular guy here, right? Your diplomatic credential is valid next month in a different country, not right here, right now. Right here, right now, you're just coming in on your regular passport. Um, so then we've got a bunch of stuff, uh, you know, SI base units of size and weight. You know, how big is this thing? How heavy is this thing? Um, and then the World Customs Organization is, you know, the, the international organization of customs agencies. They've got all this stuff standardized and have for a long time for, you know, paperwork. Uh, you know, crate number three of a shipment of five, right? Stuff like that. Uh, you know, how many barrels is it? Um, standardized packaging and so forth is all really well standardized already, right? So we don't need to reinvent any of that. Um, names, serial numbers, distinguishing marks, and then external references. Um, what about a link to a photograph of the thing? So you can look at a picture of it and say, does that look like the thing in front of me, right? Does this look like the person in front of me? Pretty straightforward. So then we get into the distribution side of this. How do we communicate the digital emblem to the validator? How does the validator find out about this thing? So let's run through those. Um, for data at rest and data in flight, uh, for data at rest, there are kind of three possibilities, right? Either the emblem encapsulates the data, so we have the emblem and the data get shoved inside the emblem, or the emblem and the data are sitting next to each other on some media, or the emblem gets shoved into the data and is encapsulated within the data, right? So those are our three possibilities. And, you know, side by side is easy. It's just like two files or whatever. Um, and then we've got different ways of doing encapsulation already. Plenty of standards that we can use there. MIME, which is used for email, is, for instance, a perfectly mature one. Uh, for data in flight, this is going to be TLS, right? I'm not a TLS expert. Lots of people are. This is going to be some sort of TLS thing. Uh, In-band network response. We've already got this. Dane. Uh, DNS, DNSSEC, Dane. Issue a certificate. Done. Um, Passive RF responders and active RF responders. Again, RFID, done. We just take what's already existing. Active RFID beacon. So this is something where you would query it and it would respond. Or sorry, sorry, uh, beacon. Uh, this is like radio station. It's just broadcasting the signal. And you listen and you've got it. Um, so that could be just on some specific frequency that the validator and the issuer both know is supposed to be used for this, or it could be spread spectrum or whatever, who knows, right? This is one of those things that is going to be very specific to the use case and the validator and the issuer it's for them to work out. It doesn't really have anything to do with the, um, the data model. Uh, passive optical marking. This is the physical marking of the digital marking that replaces the physical marking. So that could be a QR code, right? Could be letters painted on the side of something, uh, barcodes, printed text. It could be like an e-ink screen that displays the data. Um, 
whatever. It just needs to be some way. It's like communicating a URL, right? You just need to be able to get that label across so that the validator can check it. Active optical transponder, right? This would be hypothetically like you blink the flashlight at them and they blink the flashlight back. Who knows? This is like if you build a matrix, this is a, a spot in the matrix. I don't know if there's a use case for that or not. Active optical beacon. At first, I was thinking, you know, active optical beacon, who's going to do that? And then I started talking with the aviation folks, and they were like, that's the one. That's the important one that we're going to do. Uh, so taking the navigation lights on an aircraft, it turns out there's already a standard for modulating data on that. Um, it's, a, it's an 802.11 standard, just like Ethernet. So you can modulate the data on existing uh, navigation and hazard lights. Uh, you could do the same thing on the light bar of an emergency vehicle, um, lighthouses, you know, anything where you've got some sort of light, if you can modulate it fast enough, you can put data on it. And that is an active optical beacon, which, okay, cool. Um, active audio transponder, you, that's like Amazon Echo or whatever. You talk to it and it talks back to you. Is there a use case? I don't know and active audio beacon so that's kind of like the optical one right you could modulate data onto an existing sound source right if that's a siren on a fire truck for instance you could modulate data onto that uh you could do this at audible frequencies or above or below audible frequencies uh you could do it steganographed into like background music, right? All kinds of cool tricks you can do with this. So let me just run through a couple of interesting use cases that came out of like all the, the use case interviews at the beginning of the process. So diplomatic pouches. Um, this is one of the really obvious use cases. And there are obviously a lot of, of foreign ministries out there shipping stuff around. Um, but let's talk through this. So the law says that you can't delay or inspect it, right? Customs agent receives the diplomatic pouch. It comes in, it's in with a lot of other stuff. That one, they can't delay. It can't sit around there and they can't inspect it. They can look at the outside of it, but they can't open it up and they can't weigh it and they can't x-ray it. They're only allowed to look a, a passive optical inspection of the outside. All right. So the problem here is that people smuggling contraband know this and can mark their crate diplomatic pouch, and that makes it illegal to inspect. And yet they are smuggling contraband and they're not authorized by anybody to do that. That is inherently illegal. So the customs agent is in this dilemma. What do they do? They've got something marked diplomatic pouch and yet it could contain contraband. So if they can scan something on that and cryptographically verify that it was shipped by the foreign ministry of Japan, it can be entirely full of cocaine and it's not their problem. It's the foreign ministry of Japan's problem because it was under their authorization that it was shipped and we haven't inspected it. We haven't looked inside, we haven't weighed it. We have no idea whether it's cocaine or not, doesn't matter, not our problem. On the other hand, we scan it and we get an invalid scan right doesn't validate we can go to town on it open it up whatever because it's not actually a diplomatic pouch at that point that was a false marking so we can't do that with physical marking there's just no way to tell we have to depend on all these other things right we have to get on the phone with the foreign ministry of japan logistics people and hope that they also speak swahili right good luck uh okay so unesco this was a really interesting one because we'd done all of these interviews with folks who wanted to attach a label to a thing. We get to UNESCO and they're like, yeah, we've got all these artworks that get shipped around between countries to, you know, uh, exhibitions and stuff. And then we've got these buildings and we've got whole neighborhoods and so forth. And neighborhoods is no big deal, right? Because you're just defining a polygon right? Just like that airplane flight, right? We're defining a polygon and saying, yes, it's here now, it's been here, and it will continue to be here in the future, we hope, right? That's no problem. But the artworks, it turns out that like a double digit percentage of the artworks that are protected are in an unknown location, 
because they got stolen out of a museum that um, the the uh, Mexican National uh, Archaeology Museum in Mexico City that got knocked over in like 96, 98 back then sometime, a whole lot of that stuff's still out in the wind. Uh, there's the Iraqi National Cultural Museum, thousands and thousands of pieces out there that were protected or, you know, out there somewhere. And so we need some way that a uh, law enforcement officer, that a um, uh, auction house can check to see whether a thing that, you know, came out of somebody's attic is actually a protected cultural artifact that was stolen. Um, and so what we need is a digital emblem that has a ton of external references to all the sort of known photographs and data about that thing so that somebody who gets a hold of it can be reasonably expected to reassociate it with the emblem. So we've got a bunch of handling flags in there about like, is the location of the object known? Is the location of the emblem known? Are they in the same place? All that. Press. Press is interesting because we've we've talked about all these ones where there's some authority that is associated with the body of law or an authority that's allowed to ship something or, or whatever, right? But who, who are press people? A press person is a person who's doing journalism and is a non-combatant. That's the definition of a press person. If they're a combatant, they no longer have the protections that a civilian would. They may be doing journalism as a job, but now they're a combatant, so they're not protected. Um, but fundamentally, there's no central agency that says you're a journalist and you're not. So there's nobody that can say, you know, we're the authentic source of this. So we need a solution that journalists could do for themselves or NC or CPJ could do on behalf of uh, journalists who are in dangerous situations. Um, sites. So sites is the, uh, the treaty organization that oversees the body of law around uh, endangered species. So plants and animals that are globally recognized as endangered all have to be shipped with all these markings anytime they cross national borders. Um, but if you've got an animal, it's really important that the handling be done properly, right? So we've got to be able to communicate that in a fairly detailed way. And it's really important that the communications channel back work in case like the animal gets sick or whatever, right? Same thing's true of plants, of course, it's just a little bit less obvious. Um, and then aviation, aviation is interesting, a little bit like press, right? You've got this no dual use thing where as long as there's no military use of the aircraft, it's not uh, carrying munitions, it's not carrying uh, troops, anything like that it's protected as a civilian thing and there's additional bodies of law under ICAO that, that give it additional protections beyond just what a regular civilian would have. Um, so we've got this question of whether there's any military use of that aircraft. But then there's also this interesting thing going on. Um, like if you talk with Airbus folks, they're starting to build RFID scanners into every opening in the hull of an aircraft so that they can automatically create a manifest of everything that's RFID tagged that's going in and out of the aircraft. Now, their idea of why this is important largely has to do with spare parts, right? So they've got these expert systems and reporting and so forth on the aircraft about failures. And the expert systems predict what spare parts are gonna be necessary to repair that failure. So they're starting to do this manifest radio ahead thing where there's, uh, you know, can be relayed on to the airport that they're gonna land at, what parts the expert system thinks are gonna be needed to turn the aircraft around and get it in the air again, so that the logistics supply chain can get those parts to the gate with somebody qualified to install them before the plane even lands, right? So they're minimizing the, the downtime of the aircraft. Um, but the thing is, if we've already scanned all these digital emblems that are in the hold, you know, people coming in as passengers and so forth, we can include that in that radio head manifest and that can get split out to customs and immigration so that they know what the exception cases that are gonna be coming 
into them off that aircraft are. So that was it. Um, plenty of time for questions if you guys want. Got about 10 minutes. Um, again, it's this is a standards efforts happening in the IETF. Um, hypothetically, you could implement this a bunch of different ways. You can invent new stuff, but all the actual implementers at this point are doing it on top of DNS. So DNS, DNSSEC for the cryptographic signatures, Dane for the certificates, and then DE on top of that using existing record types almost exclusively. Um, so if anybody has questions, come up to the front mic. Mm. Yeah. Like QR codes, barcodes, oh. or uh, have like you know. Hey, uh, hey, hey, hang on just a sec. Can you guys hear him, or is that mic on? Yeah. Okay. Can be loud because I'm I'm having a hard time. Okay. Uh, QR codes and barcodes have redund enough redundancy so that you can play games with them and you can, for instance, put, you know, readable, human readable texts and pictures uh, in them. And so it looks like it could be a nice way of, uh, you know, putting labels that are both computer readable and uh, readable to a human uh, in the field. Has, uh, has that been discussed in this context? So the... There are essentially two ways that the digital emblem can get delivered. The The main way is sort of like a website would be you're, you're sort of reading the URL, the label. In this case, it's going to be a DNS label. And then you go do a lookup and you get the data and you evaluate the data. So you know where to get that data based on the label and you know what format to expect that data in. So that per se is not really going to be the issue, right? If you enter the right label, like if, if you have to retype it, you, you better not mistype, sure, um, but the odds are if you mistype, you're not going to get any sort of result, right? You're not going to, I mean, you get an error, right? Um, so with a QR code or a barcode or something or an RFID, um, there's more of a potential for you scan something, but the, the human being doesn't really know what it is that they've just scanned. So, you know, somebody could affix a, a fake label over the real one or replace it or whatever and misdirect them to the wrong place. So that's where you start to get the need for the bindings, right? The, the validator is an expert, right? They're a customs agent. They're trained to evaluate this stuff. Now you're just passing them more information. And with the higher expectation of, of bandwidth there, of more information, it's going to give them more tools to do that evaluation, right? Whether the uh, whether this is real or fake, there's a, a higher bandwidth channel for them to work with. So, you know, could you game it? Probably. They're always clever hackers. Uh, but building on top of a lot of existing work that's already really well tested you know, we're, we're doing sort of the minimal new work possible. So sir. you mentioned various encodings like MIME and such. It makes me think of X509 and the richness of metadata that can be represented in X509 for certificates. Do you see different use cases forcing extensions onto validators the way that descriptions are applied for other use cases. Right now, you're really focused on customs, right? Customs officials and this problem that you mentioned of um, proliferation of proprietary scanners. But what about like the US Cyber Trust label for IoT devices that has metadata about those IoT devices? Could that apply or would there be extensions? So um, in the IETF, the way the politics work, if you try and bite off something too large, it gets too many people's interest, and then they all show up with their opinions, and then nothing happens. And so the constraining this to markings required under international law is a constraint that keeps people who are um, interested in other things off in their silo instead of in this silo. Uh, 
or you know out, outside the tent pissing out rather than inside the tent pissing in or why i don't know um but i mean hypothetically we get this work done and you know there's self-driving cars out there wouldn't it be nice if the stoplight had a you know official authorized by the city of oakland california you know it's green right now and you know two seconds later it's orange and two seconds after that it's red whatever right um there are a zillion uses you can put something to once you have the tool right once you standardize the tool you've got all the libraries you've got all the open you know code there's a lot you can do so then then on the cryptographic side you know x509 and you know different kinds of of encryption and and signing again we're trying to only add the little bit at the top not do any new crypto right all the crypto we're just inheriting out of dnssec and there are a lot of people who care about dns security and a lot of people are working on you know post quantum crypto for DNSSEC, uh, you know, elliptic curves that are not ones recommended by the NSA. There's a lot of work going on there. And if we try and do all that also, it's just going to make everything more complicated. One other thought or question on the loitering munition thing that you said, I immediately thought, well, uh, someone's just going to mislabel the, their, uh, you know, tank or other thing. But I think that goes to the visual description integrity or something there with with that and also the Hague uh piece that you mentioned the the physical binding uh, you know only goes so far right like people will gain that yeah yeah and w one of the one of the things sorry I, I didn't mention um if you've got a delivery mechanism that can actually deliver a lot of data like you know a big rfid can deliver you know many k bytes of data um you can take the whole thing and cram it in there. And as long as the validator has cached the root signatures, then they can validate everything you hand them based on following that signature chain, starting just with the root signature. So you can do offline validation. You don't need to be, you know, on the network. So there, there are a lot of people get very hung up on the military use cases because they're kind of cool and fun. And so a lot of people worry about uh, covert uh, inspection, right? They want to be able to look at one of these things without alerting anybody that they're looking and to do the validation without alerting anybody that they're validating because they don't want to warn people that they're about to attack something. And so, you know, doing it this way gives you all of that already for free, right? Because you can hand over that data, you know, on a a beacon or whatever, uh, they can validate it using a single cache signature. It's it's pretty robust. I'm not sure if that covered your question because honestly, I can't actually hear it's more of the military use case. And uh, the first point that you said, it's a reiteration of your first first point, basically that it does nothing to honor the physical binding. Uh, military can game the system because the try and mislabel things in adversarial scenarios is, it, is it where I was. I think my brain was going. We can okay, tell Thank you what, you. yeah, catch me after because I honestly can't hear a damn thing, sorry. Uh, and we're within a couple minutes of out of time right now. Uh, if there's one last question and somebody can say it really loudly, we can do it. Otherwise, let's call it done a little bit early. All right. Well, thank you all very, very much. Um, I guess you can see up there the URLs for the, the IETF documents. Take care.